world's most creative and influential cinematographers. Since 1968, he has photographed over 30 feature films all over the world. Vieni su man mano tu Enrico, continua Mauro, continua Mauro. Alza 10.000 Enrico. Torraro is not only a great cinematographer, but he's a man of ideas. And he has really uh, uplifted our profession by uh, his theories in which he considers, and I think he's right, that we contribute to the writing uh, of the film. I mean, his images are not only beautiful or professional, they actually tell the fino a questo momento di incredibile equilibrio tra il tramontare del sole e il nascere della luna del blu è tutta una vita che li inseguo ogni volta per tentare di fotografare di scrivere con questo solo, con quella luna con quell'ombra, con quella luce una storia e una storia essendo il cinema un linguaggio di immagini e essendo un'immagine formata dalla luce e della sua assenza che è l'ombra e da tutti quelli che sono i componenti interni a se stessa che sono i colori va comunque scritta Vittorio Storaro, Apocalypse Now! Well, I would make any film with Vittorio being such a great photographer and whatever project you approach him with, he will find something in it uh, that will interest him and drive him. Francis, thank you. Thank you for the trust that you gave me. Thank you for the freedom. You give me to express completely myself in a public style. Uh, Victorio is a very elegant, beautiful person. And he would always be there in the jungle in his white clothes, looking like some prince from, you know, uh, Siena. And even when he fell from the ladder in the mud, he would get up and not be dirty. So, uh, you know, I think Victorio carries a style and a grace with him just that's in his, you know, in his personality. And the winner is Vittorio Storaro for Red. He's simply the best in the world, in my opinion, at what he does. And sometimes it's difficult, and I just love it when he makes mistakes. <laughs> There's a story I like very much because we were making Reds, and um, I had had the temerity to ask if a light that I saw in a factory sequence before had been, um, was right. He called me at about 8 o'clock one night, distraught. He said that he had to talk to me. I came in, I said, Vittorio, what is it? I thought maybe something had happened to his children or his wife or some terrible thing. And, and he said that he had, he had destroyed the sequence. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, I've, 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 I've destroyed the, the factory, he said. And uh, I said, well, let's go look at it, you know. It really looked very good, you know. And uh, I was a little upset that the mistake wasn't big enough. And the winner is... The winner is... Vittorio Storaro for the last effort. Together, we had uh, wonderful moments, very difficult moments, and we shared 
a lot. And um, that made uh, Victoria kind of need for me. I need it. I need it. The last tempo really represents for me the result of 20 years of collaboration with Bernardo Bertolucci. A long, difficult, hard journey that was so made beautiful by a, a traveling guide, by a friend like Bernardo. And I really do think that in To Last Tempero, there is not only one movie, but there is all of ourselves. Thank you very much. Bernardo. When you go to see a movie of mine, the choice of the lens, the camera movement, the relationship between the camera and the characters and the places, the space where I'm shooting, I take care of that. What I don't do, what Vittorio does, is the uh, physical intervention of the light. The light, he paints with lights. I don't think that each cinematographer can work with each director. I don't think that each cinematographer can do any project, any film. There is a kind of magnetic selection that you're doing while you're going. There is a kind of journey that you're doing by yourself. And suddenly you discover that uh, on the same direction you can meet other people. And you can meet a friend that you can do this journey. You can, you can meet people that you can be your guide for a portion of, the, of this journey. I think Bernardo was one of those, one of the most important ones. The Conformist was Bertolucci's and Storaro's first international success and was a highly influential film for its style, design and use of colour. Set in the 1930s, it's the story of Marcello Clerici, sent by fascists in Rome to carry out an assassination in Paris while on his honeymoon. Before we start The Conformist, Bernardo called me. We were starting to talk about the conformities. Vittorio, I mean, what we know about that period, mainly we know that period, the, the, the late 30, through cinema. I remember that uh, Bernardo saw at that moment uh, one of the Visconti films, The Damnet. And he told me, Vittorio, that can be beautiful, maybe we can do a movie like this one. And I went to see it, I said, no, Bernardo, I think that photography is so great for that movie. We should come up with something very original, something very that belong to us. At the fascist time at that point at the, in Italy was very, something very strong, something very difficult to, to go through. So the only way for me to, to represent that period was to drain color and go very strong in a kind of prison, in a kind of claustrophobic uh, feeling between uh, light and shadows without any <laughs> harmony at all. There's one scene in The Conformist where um it's the interior of uh, Stefania Sandrelli's house where I wanted to have uh, to play it with um, stri stripes of light given by Venetian blinds so that they would become the main uh, the main feature of the scene and I had conceived the room completely striped with light what Vittorio added to it was uh, the movement of those stripes oh which is totally surreal and not justified <laughs> Vittorio mm. was a moving, a big light mm. on a, a elevating thing, platform, and was moving up. And we looked at each other. On the wall, you, we, we saw this uh, typical uh, 40s um, stri uh, stripes moving that. And, uh, and we said, let's do, it. let's do it in a very excessive way. There wasn't even the consciousness of being maybe quoting expressionism or uh, German directors in Hollywood. And it was just the pleasure of seeing that there. From the moment that Marcello Clarici leave Rome and take uh, a train, there's a kind of opening in the light. The light is going to um, go into the shadows, almost uh, marry it. And, and the colors start to come out. And the, in the train, there is no any more realistic thing. Everything is going through fantasy. Uh, they spent 10 hours on traveling, and so we were showing it through the light change into two-minute sequence, the 10 hours traveling. They are arriving in Paris. Paris at that moment it was the land of the free way of living. 
you can say something that you, you're not able to say in, in, a, in your country. And at that moment, uh, I was trying to open completely the color spectrum, open completely the light and shadows. At the time, uh, colors were used with more, in a more cautious way, in American movies especially, and everything was pretty and well balanced. And he had just extreme reds and blues, and uh, you can tell he's an Italian, that he comes from a tradition of painting of people who use color, colorists. This is a very sensual scene. Uh, and uh, you see the, the circle around it, or not only in lines, but in movement. The great advantage we filmmakers have uh, in relationship to painters. Here I saw a film in which the cinematography really joined forces with the director's work to do something that in many cases was to extremely illogical. Uh, where the camera participated in the action almost uh, as a character would, and, and, and it worked very beautifully. That when I selected Victorio to be the cinematographer of Apocalypse Now, I did so because I felt that uh, the kind of uh, poetic vision I had hoped for uh, uh, with Apocalypse would require a photographer to have this kind of intellect and this type of attitude towards the cinema. Updating Joseph Conrad's novel, Heart of Darkness, to the Vietnam War, Apocalypse Now follows Willard, played by Martin Sheen, on his journey upriver on a secret mission to kill the renegade Colonel Kurtz. Shot on location in the Philippines, it was Storaro's first American movie. Against the big industry, the American big industry, uh, I was afraid, I was scared I was not at the right level of Apocalypse Now. And Francis, in this case, was fantastic because my English at that moment was even poorer than what is to now. Uh, and Matt, I remember I never had a problem with language about Francis. The last one is, uh, is the possible, but it's not, all the time, it's not exactly the same time. I think we're going to have to live with that because it's okay. But because I could not speak English and I could not speak Italian. In yeah. fact, I could speak more Italian. Uh, than he could speak English, so I was dealing with an extremely intelligent, uh, creative person, uh, and we had no method of communication, which sometimes provides a more pure form of communication. Victorio was trying to deal with this enormous uh, problem of logistics and helicopters flying so high that they weren't in the front, just, just coming up against a lot of um, tasks that were beyond our ability, we, of course, uh, personally um, were continually worn down, and, and yet the, uh, our friendship developed, and uh, both with uh, Vittorio and with Dean Tavaleras, the production designer, was sort of the three of us in this together, but we did have like ambition. We're doing the storyboard in America without Vittorio. And uh, then we got his, his ideas and put them in the storyboard. If you talk to him about an idea that you think is pretty crazy, he'll take it and say, you know, if he likes it, he'll take it and, you know, make it even more elaborate and more daring. We approached the helicopter sequence first for logic reason, because we were afraid not to have a um, the helicopter for a long time. Uh, we didn't know exactly each day how many helicopters we could have. So uh, they thought, let's do in the helicopter first. And so anything happened, at least we, we put on film that major sequence. After that major sequence, the movie told to us at which level we're supposed to perform. Any moment that we were doing any single shot, even simple one, sometimes it's just a close up, behind that close up, we maybe should put some color smoke. We maybe should put some uh, napple uh, explosion. We maybe supposed to put some helicopter. So any shot in any simple sequence, it become a major issue. Apocalypse now for me, even at the beginning, I was not clear how and why I can be into this kind of a world. Soon I read um, the book from Conrad, I understood the main idea 
was a, an overing position between one culture to another culture. Right away, I translate that kind of idea between two different energy, the natural energy and artificial energy. For example, it was very easy to show the natural light uh, that was in the Vietnam against the artificial light brought by the, the American. For example, the big glass searchlights that they were using during nights and the light made by the explosion. I was trying to translate that conflict between two different nations, the two different cultures, two different civility, through a conflict of lights, lights and shadows, through a warm color and cold color and so on. Put in conflict something that was not supposed to be in conflict. Where there is no doubt that apocalypse now, like Hearts of Darkness, is a process of knowledge. It is a journey. And this journey is not only upriver, but it's also a journey within ourselves. Vittorio's attitude was always, you know, well, Francis, we go step by step. You know, we just go one step, and then we look, and we do another step, and it was always that philosophy. Willard's journey comes to an end when he encounters the private army of Kurtz, who has made his base at an old temple in the middle of the jungle. For the important role of the crazed colonel, Coppola had cast Marlon Brando. As so many things in art, the portrayal of Kurtz is done through the nature of the materials themselves. And uh, the fact was that Brando we had for a very little time. Brando is an extraordinary uh, a man beyond his ability as an actor, but extremely, in a way, childlike person and mercurial and very difficult to pin down. And so we had to do what we had to do in a few weeks and we were going to lose him. We just started almost in the dark with Brando's presence and uh, Vittorio began to experiment with you know, how little could we show of him, partly because he was physically unacceptable for the role of a Green Beret colonel. And Brando is very shy about his weight and size. And so we knew that we were going to have to do this with illusion and a little sliver of light. And once Vittorio began experimenting along those lines, he himself began to create a way to approach it. I wonder, my hair's been cut off so long, and I think that I'll be bald. I'm afraid that I'll be bald when it grows back. I, I don't care, except that I want my, I don't want my family to see me bald. I want that close up of Marlon Brando coming out from the obscurity and reveal himself step by step, uh, point by point, uh, ray by ray, is like uh, coming out, something coming out from, from a darkness. The visual feeling of, of a revealing of our own unconscious. I was asking to myself how I can represent this journey into our unconscious. And uh, so I thought that maybe, maybe the only way is to represent the same structure of our own life with the structure of the light itself. So the journey into ourself the willer is doing is the journey they could do within the color spectrum, starting from the beginning to end into light to represent life. So that's why, for example, we, Earth of Darkness is being represented by the black. Black is the, is the unconscious, is really where everything starts. And the first step is red, is the, um, the color of the blood. Orange is the color of the warm feeling of the family. Yellow is the consciousness. Green is the, is the process of knowing, of knowledge. Blue is your intelligence as a human being. Indigo is your material power. Violet is your last stage in the human life. And the sum, all of this color, is the last one, is white, which means balance, which means equilibrium. Photography means write with light. So I was trying to write with light, and with this element, the colors, the story itself. After assassinating Kurtz, Willard's mission is seemingly over. But Coppola had to decide whether to end the film simply with Willard's departure, 
or to have him call in strategic air command and then show the destruction of the temple. The idea was blowing up all the temple. And we shot the blowing of the temple. Probably the most incredible scene ever done. It was shot with several cameras in vista vision, in high speed, in, in infrared. fantastic visual uh, image I've ever done in my own life. In the editing process, and just Francis thought that maybe he doesn't need anymore to blow up the uh, temple, because that was not part of the main concept. I think he was right. Well, this now was, uh, was really a closing chapter. Well, I stopped for one year. I didn't shoot for one year. And I went through a long research into the only possible thing that I knew at that moment light. What is uh, uh, representing light? What is forming light? Colors. One from the art was the continuous the journey into this bath of color. I bought a movie studio and uh, some writer sent me a little love story called One from the Heart and I thought well we'll just make that real quickly and we'll make it in an experimental way and basically trying to make a film more in a soundstage situation using illusion and effects and theatrical tricks to express what was going on instead of real location. Set in a studio recreation of Las Vegas, Coppola's simple love story concerned the relationship between a disenchanted couple, Hank and Franny. The spirit of experimentation gave Storaro the opportunity to explore the physiology of colors. One from the Heart is a, is a movie about, I think, uh, emotional state between people. Mm. People will follow the story, will fall in love with the character, but I think that choosing the right direction of light and color can help tell the story, which kind of character she is, which kind of character he is, and so on. Specific, the character of Hank and Franny. Hank, to me, is green. Like uh, Franny is red. That maybe is a, an unrealistic way to see the characters, but this is kind of sensation they have from them. In the way that the, the main conflict starts between them, that she needs activity. She needs to have a wonderful uh, weekend and then go out and do something. I need a rest. There's a, the, the conflict between two colors. She needs to be in red. I need to be in green. <laughs> there is no questions about it. This is just something that should work really underneath, something very subtle into the air. Uh, cold color next to you, blue or green? Well, that you... Not this one, you see? There is something very, very innocent at the beginning that we can, uh, can, can come that out. That one. And uh, if you're doing the, the, clo the short hairs, I don't think they should be black. No? Should be darker, but still brown, warm color. <laughs> There's so much light around in the, in the street of Vegas. Vegas make a, a sort of conflict with the nature. You rebuild the daylight to neon, so the body feel to gambling, feel to play, feel to live. Don't, don't want to rest. Don't want to go to sleep. like all of us, is, is totally nuts and uh, is in his own universe and uh, very much, you know, in a way as I am. And he became intrigued with the theater techniques that I was sharing with him. And I told um, Victorio about this 
kind of lighting board, which I was very f experienced in myself from my theater days. And I think uh, Vittorio became very excited about the possibility of using these uh, techniques, which were common in theater, but apply them uh, to with film in a, in a way to be able to manipulate color and light in a much more adept way than film allowed. So we went out and bought some $300,000 lighting board and set it up in our own studio, which enabled us to do all these experiments. Spostiamo, dico, non ti preoccupare. Eh, Ish, can you read me up there? Direttore. Can you go up to the jump on your right side? The system that he always uses, uh, he's been using actually for about eight years uh, with uh, dimmers. Um, he puts every light on a dimmer and he's come up with the jumbo light, which is 16 um, airplane landing lights. And in this particular movie, we're using to give the street a different wash of color. All we knew we needed to do is set them and then we can uh, turn them off and on just by, you know, <laughs> getting on and talking to control, which uh, does save. It saves a lot of energy and saves a lot of time. Turn on your left and follow me. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All the way down. All the way down. You should be arriving right here. Fabio, can you hear me? Yeah. Can I see 80? 80. OK, 85. Abbiamo fatto una pianta del set con tutte le disposizioni delle luci e nu numerandole. E questo permette, dopo una preparazione, una facilità estrema nel nell'illuminare. Fabio, I need also the two jumbo on, uh, on top of the police station, which are 70 and 71, please. That warm up. Over. I'm gonna love you. When you begin working with Vittorio on a picture, it's like getting into a huge vegetable soup. And you really come up with vegetables that you didn't know existed. <laughs> and, uh, and you mix it, and you mix it, and um, it usually tastes pretty good. I was first interested, really, in just primary colors. And uh, just as I thought that the, uh, that the picture itself dealt with primary emotions, very simple and, uh, and direct. That gets more complicated. I read the movie as a, an impossible love story between Breathless and, and, and the Crazy. And I present this idea to Warren that connected with the, where Chester Gould really had the idea to, to draw images like that. And I think they came from the German Expressionist. And everybody, I think, had the inspiration from this painter. And Chester Gould had the same thing, I think. So my idea was to try to bring this conflict, this uh, dramaturgy of color, let's say, using the drama not only between light and shadow, but between the warm color, the, the, the color of the daytime, the color that uh, belonged to one section of the color spectrum, Red, the kid, orange, Tess, yellow, the crazy, representing the sun, representing the, the one illuminating the darkness, and all uh, blue, indigo, violet, 
who is belonging to our unconscious, what we call the, the evil. Uh, I think the conflict between these two worlds was the main theme of the, of the crazy. Hai mai avuto un'età verde? È quasi impossibile, credo, non passare per il verde. Il verde credo che sia la, il collegamento tra la nostra innocenza e la nostra consapevolezza. Non possiamo non averlo. Uh, il rosso è il colore dell'io, della coscienza, della, della natura stessa. È il, credo, il simbolo più grande dell'energia dell vitale. Blu come colore non a caso del pensiero, dell'intuizione, della introspezione, di tutto ciò che riguarda uh, una parte interna di noi. Vittorio writes down what he thinks the colors are going to do to the audience emotionally. We all know what Goethe did and Newton did and all the writing that has been done about the fact that colors do affect people unconsciously. But his colors, he has his reasons to say yellow is this and red is that and blue is this and orange is that. Truth of it is we all have reasons. And very often they're quite different reasons. I start to put together uh, sequence by sequence on the script itself. Each given idea so can uh, the world can tell exactly what I would like to say. After I've done all this journey within my mind and try to translate in words, physically word, next to the script, next to the scene itself, only at that moment I can really start filming. Bertolucci's The Sheltering Sky, based on the novel by Paul Bowles, is the tragic story of Kit and Port, an American couple whose disintegrating marriage is strained by their journey through Morocco ending with his death and her mental collapse. For Storaro, their individual destinies related to the journeys of the sun and the moon and the extreme colors of the desert landscape and the sky. However, away from the studio on location, the cinematographer has to face challenges of a different kind. Nothing will stop us. Nobody will stop us. He always shoots. I rarely have met a um, director of photography who always shoots. Because the pleasure of shooting is stronger than the fact that suddenly when you are in the full sun, a cloud comes, the light changes. The other camera said, stop, we wait for the... No, he goes on because anyway, um, the light will work and uh, it starts to rain. We go on. Uh, originally, we were supposed to do a dawn sequence, waiting for the sun rising in this terrace. And uh, there is Mrs. Lyla waiting to photograph the sunrise. And a port is right there just facing this moment. We had such bad weather that day. It was so cold. The Friday, we changed completely the mood of the, the, the scene in the way that was around, but the sun rise, I was able to recreate it myself. And in this case, the difficult weather was helping me because on doing it by myself, I can control much better the sun rise. Port, durante il percorso della storia, sembra sempre più prendere coscienza con il sole, con l'immagine di se stesso, con l'identificazione del suo simbolo. Sul terrazzo di Bussife lo aspetta al mattino, lo guarda in faccia per guardarsi in faccia, nel senso che sa che forse un'intima consapevolezza interna a se stesso, il percorso dello stesso astro è il percorso della sua vita. Il sole nel suo correre nei cieli, 
dall'aurora del suo concepimento, all'alba della sua nascita, al mattino della sua crescita, alla consapevolezza del suo giorno, alla maturità del suo pomeriggio, ci giunge, arriva al tramonto della sua vecchiaia. In identificazione con lui, Port, arrivato ad inseguire il suo sogno verso il deserto in questo forte, Kit, proprio mentre il sole tramonta, Port muore, sugli spalti di questo forte, si perde davanti a questo incredibile azzurro del cielo, un azzurro che fino ad oggi non ancora non conosceva. Non conosceva perché era anche lei vissuta di sole. Il desiderio, l'alternativa è una sola. Seguire il sogno di Port. Proprio come la luna nel cielo, che segue l'arco del sole, che si illumina di sole, lei stessa quasi in simbiosi con la luna questa volta, quindi una porzione, un atto, una parte, un fin lunare. Un'altra porzione del colore del, del spettro cromatico, l'azzurro. Quello che mi succedeva una volta era, per esempio, temere l'azzurro. Temevo, mi sembrava non sufficientemente artistico, come si può dire. E facevo il grande errore di annullarlo. Mi ponevo dei gialli o degli arancioni su, su dei blu, tentando di annullare una lunghezza d'onda, tentando di annullare una parte di me stesso che era la parte inconscia di me. Quando ho capito questo ho tentato di intensificare questo tipo di idea, particolarmente in questo caso con Shelton in Sky, con Porte e Kit. Per cui se Porte mi rappresenta il sole, la terra, il deserto, ho tentato di intensificare la, la sua radice, la sua, la sua idea, quello che è il suo significato e non annullarlo. Così con Kit, nell'ultima parte della parte del film lunare, ho tentato di intensificare il colore del cielo. Ora, ovviamente, come tutte le cose, se una parte rappresenta la terra, il sole, la materia, e l'altra rappresenta la luna, l'aria, e un po' anche l'inconscio di noi stessi, la parte, il lato femminile di noi stessi, contro il lato maschile, credo che, come sempre, L'unione tra i due sia il giusto equilibrio, sia la giusta forma, sia la giusta cosa da raggiungere. Per cui la terra avrà il suo colore e il cielo avrà il suo colore, intensificato per raccontare una storia. Ieri fantastico era il luccichio del Lued. Noi lo guardavamo nella luce del tramonto, però eh, eh, eh. l'azzurro è comunque diverso. Ah, certo cioè, diverso. la cosa del tramonto chiaramente avevamo la, il brillio del controllo del fiume. Beh, potremmo partire dal tramonto? No, lei esce se già la luna adesso. Eh, beh, c'è sono pensato tutta stanotte questa. Perché noi abbiamo la cosa di lei sopra già con la luna in cui avremo questa morire del sole e nascere della luna che è un momento proprio praticamente suo come zona at a certain moment it was the beginning of our relationship i understood that like some artist uh, needs for its inspiration to have a bottle of Beaujolais or uh, to have a huge uh, um, Uh, joint of uh, grass or to have uh, any kind of uh, stimulating factor. Vittorio needs this kind of uh, his own elaboration of uh, the film. If you take away from him the freedom of uh, doing this elaboration, he loses his inspiration. So I respect that, even if I don't agree all the time. Yes, he was thinking uh, the blue and the red, the blue of the night and of the kind of lunar feeling of the woman and the uh, red, uh, uh, which is the active of the male, of the man, etc. You know, sometimes I, I think the opposite. I think the man is blue and passive and the woman is red and active. So, but he needs it. Let's let's him have it.
Immaginiamo degli uomini dentro una caverna, alcune centinaia di migliaia di anni fa, il fuoco alle loro spalle, loro che osservavano il fondo della caverna, de degli oggetti e delle persone che si muovevano, in realtà davano un'immagine della realtà, ma non la realtà, il simulacro. Forse il primordio del cinema. Noi oggi, autori della fotografia, tentiamo di proseguire il mito di Platone stesso. Tentiamo di portare avanti, in una sala cinografica che non è altro che la stessa caverna, tramite queste ombre, che andiamo a creare nello squarciare di luce la notte per poter esprimere in immagine un certo concetto. In 1983, Sororo photographed this short film using the new technology of high-definition videotape. The most sophisticated electronic format yet developed, it has already advanced further than this early experiment. Sororo plans to use high-definition cameras in the future on a feature film project with Francis Coppola. Victorio being one of the few collaborators that I've had who really can grasp a new idea, he, rather than to cling to a notion that no, the photographic image had to be a, a photochemical process, he saw that, you know, after all, uh, video is extremely young in terms of its development, and one day it would be capable of producing the kind of uh, image that film could now produce. He saw that. Because any new step, any new evolution in technology, in the, usually in, in any art form, give for the first moment a kind of stop to understand that you have to change the gear completely. Uh, I definition will do the same thing. There is no doubt that this is the future. The information that you have from the electronic point of view, you have such more freedom to express yourself than you have from a, an optical image. Even if the optical image 